you're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find more great shows like this at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is a continuation in our series called The Swamp Explained. This is where I talk to Rob Cortell, a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C. Rob has worked for Republican presidential campaigns, government agencies like the EPA, and has been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Fair Federal Maritime Commission. You'll often see him talking about the Jones Act on uh, the Cato Institute. He's also been a candidate for Congress and Senate. He's also spent years working in the private technology sector with startup companies. And given his experience and iconoclastic viewpoints, Rob gives us a great insight into the swamp that makes up our nation's capital. This is often the most celebrated uh, series of We Are Libertarians. Uh, Rob, I, I frequently get like you, you think, okay, well, libertarians talking about the swamp and, you know, you're, you're no anarchist. Uh, you think, oh, well, this audience will go, oh, this is just all statism. But I get so many kind comments going, you know, I love Rob's perspective. I think this is such a great show. Um, okay. So, you know, you know, we've been doing this for almost two years. Uh, <laughs> several, sort of randomly, two. randomly, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> We but, try to uh, get together every couple of weeks and we, we, but yeah, we've got a nice little 15, 16 episode. There's a special feed if you want to go catch up and listen to everything. Rob's got some great stories and great insights on things. And the goal here is really to kind of talk about the news and, and explain the swamp a little bit and try to understand how Washington works, because how can you change something if you don't understand it? Um, but thanks for being here, Rob. I appreciate yep, totally. it. Totally. Just wanted to share those well wishes with you. Yeah, we, well, we should tell all those people to uh, send it to five other people after this episode and get us some more viewers exactly. and ask them to do the same, or listeners. Let me tell you that the, the, uh, the period between Labor Day and Christmas in a presidential election year is the growth period for any political podcast. Yeah. And then you plateau for four years. So if you love this show... <laughs> You de we the only thing that works is you sharing it with friends personally or on your social media and, and recommending the show. So please do that. Um, well, we had a whole show planned out. We had we've been really good about coordinating, and you've been sending topics, and we've been totally. uh, looking at things, and then everything blew up last night at at eight thirty. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. Uh, she was eighty seven. She's been on the court, I believe, nominated by Clinton. Right. And uh, an icon in uh, women's rights and opening up uh, avenues to women. I mean, in the early days of her career, she couldn't get a job at a law firm, you know, let alone thinking she could be a, a Supreme well, she Court applied, justice. Uh, she, she applied for a clerkship at the Supreme Court, too, as I understand it, and got turned down. So great irony really? there. Yeah. yeah. What, what was she? I, I'm blanking on it, but she was involved in some major women's rights campaign. Well, she was involved and I was in a number of them. And what was interesting about Ginsburg was that, and you know, I'm not an expert on her or the law, but I certainly have followed it. And I loved our RPG, you know, the uh, our BG, you know, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg movie. And, and uh, she was just, an, and by the way, Trump today actually um, acted like a normal human being or yesterday and, and said, well, he was surprised and she was a great woman. And even if you disagreed with her, and I thought, well, well, gee, that was like uncharacteristically statesmanlike. And of course, he's probably our, our, lethal, which we can talk about in a minute about the political yeah, our, consequences. <laughs> our bar is so low for this guy that when I know, he says I know. <laughs> a, a moderately decent platitude about somebody, we go, oh, thank goodness, God, he's being he's, decent. He's being decent. <laughs> but uh, she was she she had a really interesting theory of a lot of things. But she she didn't go full frontal assault on all of the discrimination. The discrimination against women, and that's what she was known for. Um, she took it bit by bit, and she uh, sort of nibbled away at pieces of it and made the, the absurdity of the differences and the consequences. She connected the absurdity and the consequences really well. And, uh, and uh, she, uh, of course, was very uh, critical in uh, deciding labor law around women and equal, way, you know, equal, equal pay for equal work and things like that. She also had a, her, her philosophy about that also extended to abortion, which I, I have always thought was interesting. And wherever you stand, um, and I certainly support choice. As a conservative, I support choice. I don't know how you cannot uh, and call yourself conservative. Um, she, um, 
her view on the uh, Roe v. Wade was that it was decided without consensus, basically. She, she made the point that on gay marriage, um, society was, a, was ahead of the court. And she felt that on abortion, um, the court was ahead of, ahead of society. And in a democracy, you know, that really is what it's all about. You know, Madison's metronome, uh, this great book about his view of, of political science and discourse is that, you know, the, the metronome, you know, is that instrument that tick tock, tick tock over the piano that helps you get your rhythm correct. And, and he, he, he basically said democracy was like that. You know, you have these swings until you find a rhythm and a place in the middle that everybody can accept. This is the way things should go. And, uh, and, you know, gay marriage was decided and it's not an issue except with a, within a minute, minute number of people. Whereas abortion rights continue to be an issue across society. And, um, and, and the argument is basically that because it was forced, it created a backlash. Not that so much continued. forced, but that it happened it without, without kind of the standard paces of democracy. And again, if you're a conservative, you're not opposed to change. You support institutions and growth of, 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 of the way we think about it. You, you support public policy that evolves and that um, it doesn't jerk randomly from one side to the other. And, and uh, so I, I, for one, would hate to see any of that reverse and they've been trying to nibble around it for years. But I, I just thought philosophically that and was a very good illustration of how she viewed the law. And so... Uh, she was really significant. I thought John Roberts' statement today was was really uh, terrific. Uh, that um, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing, but that she really was an icon of history in her own right. You know, and all the Supreme Court judges will all be, by and large, their names will go down in history. But she will be uh, someone who stands tall in history that people remember for her contributions. So, uh, but she she is. You know, she knew her, what her thing was. She wanted to live to the next president. And, uh, and uh, you know, during the Obama administration, they actually tried to push her out. Um, or let me rephrase that. There were people who were said to have wanted to push her out so that uh, he could appoint uh, a judge uh, in a similar political mean, you know, meaning. I, I've seen some anger on the left at yeah. her for not, for not. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. But, that, but I, there, you don't see much of that today. I think uh, it is sad. And, you know, she also was quite tenacious and uh, as, uh, she fought cancer the way she fought everything. And, and uh, you know, and, and as she herself said, she was a great illustration of the American dream. It was, you know, she said, how long, how many, how long did it take to go from being a, a clerk to a Supreme Court justice and she said one generation her mother was an, an accounting clerk basically a clerk basically and here she was a supreme court justice and uh, and i i really agree with that i i think she was an exceptional individual and that's really what part of what makes america special in the system is allowing yeah. you know people to people from humble means to rise to places of prominence and in fairly short order as opposed yeah. to generations of nobility where it take you know it's in a class in a caste system like england or india it, it's it's well a, absolutely it's here. yeah well she also said and i think this is true a lot that she was very lucky in her choice of a life partner her husband uh was martin ginsburg marty ginsburg was uh, by all accounts uh, and i have a number of friends who knew him and i certainly have met her on occasion and him but uh, and he died, uh, you know, not actually so long ago, probably in the last five or six years. But uh, he, they met uh, when he was 18 and she was 17. And, and um, she, he was an absolute feminist, although he might not have called himself that. He, he really believed that women should be able to do anything women wanted to do and anything that men did or could do. And, and he was very supportive. And uh, he was also apparently a terrific cook. Yeah. And um, my friends who knew them well as a couple have always uh, talked about uh, how, how terrific he was and creative and, and supportive. And he was, of course, very accomplished in his own right as a lawyer and, and business person. And uh, so, um, but, you know, we should all be so lucky. And, you know, I personally feel the same thing. You know, my wife and I have been married 39 years and, uh, and we've both been very supportive over time. And, and 
you know, you, you hope that everybody has that kind of uh, experience. Not everybody does. And sometimes you got to make one or two or three tries at it, but <laughs> to get it perfect <laughs> or imperfectly, whatever. And I love the comment she was quoted on the other day. It was saying her mother gave her two pieces of advice, the best one of which was, sometimes you just have to be a little deaf. And she <laughs> said, in marriage, and she, <laughs> hard of hearing. And she said that that was true in marriage. And frankly, it was true in everything she'd ever done, including in the courtroom and, and on the Supreme Court, <laughs> which I thought was great. And yeah, that, that's one thing that stands out is, and this is a feature of the swamp versus the Trumpism, you know, the, the, the willingness to fight on every, you know, the, the, the world we're in now is the extreme sides want to fight on everything. And the thing that I've noticed is, you know, you, you listen to these swampy podcasts like The Hacks or something from The yeah. Bulwark or, you know, y y you get a sense of, uh, we'll illustrate it with RGB, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life. Um, great friends with Antonin Scalia. You saw yep. this when, when he passed away, riding elephants, getting along, uh, arguing with each other. And, and her mode of operation was essentially, I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to look at the long term. I'm going to pick my fights where I can. I'm going to be strategic about it. I'm going to be principled and work through the system to, to um, change. And no, it may not be fast, but it will get done eventually. But I'm not going to give into that anger and that, that quick burst. And that seems to be such a feature, especially in the legal community. When people talk about the swamp or the establishment, so many of them are lawyers and mm -hmm debating and arguing and process are such a part of that mindset, you know, and I find myself attracted to that because it seems so much more of a better way to work things through something like, like I mentioned the Confederate statues. Yeah. It feels good to get a mob together and go pull down that statue. But by having the hearing and, and going through the democratic Republican process of standing around and going, this, this group gets to be heard out. This group gets to be part of this, everybody. And you may lose, but at the end of the day, that statue will come down and everybody will feel heard. And that tension is dispersed as opposed to just creating the resentment over a mob taking something down. And that's, well, and I th yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, and I think Chris, some of that is, um, uh, you know, I think a person like uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Scalia and all, so many others like that, they, there's both a personal aspect to um, your relationships, there is a sort of a tactical aspect, if you will, and then there's and that is sort of you know comes into the long term strategic aspect. So Ginsburg, um, in her cases and what she did, she would lay down a marker uh, and, and and take a little bit here and then be able to use that again as three step forward and one step back, kind of uh, in her legal cases, and that's that's really true of a lot of stuff. Of course, your point about um, the, so you should be able to talk to people who are totally different. And, and you know, Biden has some of these issues um, among the Black Lives Matter people and others, you know, because he, he actually admitted that he had cordial relationships with, um, with some of the Southern senators and Strom Thurmond and some of these others who were out and out racist. Although, you know, even Thurman had a little bit of a, realization at some point and uh, maybe it was political but it, it it that he needed black voters <laughs> and so but um and, and now we can get into the whole conversation about what can be excused and what can't but um the reality is we, we just everyone is imperfect and they are certainly imperfect in politics um and you think about how many people cancel out their spouse's vote and uh uh and still manage to get along. So, and actually, you know, it, it leads me to this. Uh, so I was thinking about Biden and all of that. Uh, and, and, uh, but it also leads me to think a little bit about uh, the upcoming election night and all that. And, you know, there are a lot of topics, you know, I'd like to get to, but uh, uh, you know, there are already people talking about what if he loses and doesn't leave and, and when will we know and, um, and all of that. And I'm, I'm only reminded of, uh, two events, certainly in my lifetime, um, where one could have called foul, and one was uh, Kennedy Nixon, and um, when the results out of Cook County came in late enough to to change the, the state of Illinois, which gave the election to to Kennedy, 
And Nixon uh, felt strongly that there was clear evidence that there had been uh, cheating, but he basically, with all his faults, chose to accept the results. And he wrote about it later, and, others, and it was true that he felt that, uh, you know, you have to let the democratic process play out and and some things just aren't perfect. And uh, then, upholding course, the system was part of why he he stepped down and resigned. Well, as that's president. right, absolutely. And then you ha- and then Ken- and then you have Gore v-, v. Bush, you know W. The same thing. And Gore's I, I heard Gore's statement yesterday. Uh, heard him talking about that again, and I thought, well, that you know that is in the tradition that you just alluded to. And um, so who knows what will happen? But but you know everybody's lining up at the barricades. Yeah, my my advice to listeners, and we're going to do some shows on this because the attack on the vote. So, I was I ran a Senate campaign against Dan Coats, and I know I've met him a couple times. I know many people who worked for him when he was a senator. Uh, both times he was a senator, I've heard I've never heard anything bad about Dan Coats uh, from here in Indiana, and you know, Dan Coates was the director of national intelligence, which means he sat in meetings that I will never sit in. And the guy just knows more than I do. And so when he writes an article in the New York Times, an op-ed saying the, the country cannot recover from delegitimizing the election. This is this, the most chilling thing I thought in 2016 was when Donald Trump kind of hinted he wouldn't accept the results of the election. Yeah. Now, lo and behold, Hillary Clinton never did either. And look at where we're that's at. That's right. Oh, that's right. You, you, you introduce that seed of your vote doesn't count, and all of a sudden, the entire system starts to crumble. And you, you go to a very scary place historically um, when you look back at history. But, you know, what I, what I try to tell people is go, go find out how you signed your name on your voter registration. That's what I, I've been a part of two recounts. And what, what you will see in this election, if it is close specifically in Florida, where there's 2,500 lawyers on standby, 700 right. in Texas, according right. to James Carville, is you get two teams of lawyers fighting over a single ballot. And if you didn't cross the T on your name, they go, well, they didn't intend to vote for this person. This is, or this is not a real a ballot. This is fraudulent. Like 25% of them get thrown out because the signatures look like wildly different. But the, the fights come down to you know, several dozen ballots in some cases, like in Minnesota or here in Indianapolis and the ones that were there fighting over the signature. So how right. you sign your name in these swing states really come, makes a big difference. And I, I don't, you know, I, when Bill Maher floated the idea that Trump wouldn't leave or that Trump wouldn't accept the a loss, everybody laughed at him. And I was like, why are we laughing? Because that's a perfectly logical I think either side are so primed to go, this isn't a legitimate election. Or if you get this Supreme Court nominee through in 50 days, this isn't a Supreme Court, a real Supreme Court. Kavanaugh should be impeached, this person. Right. I guess the question of legitimacy is never something that I've seen questioned in my lifetime. I don't know if it has been in yours, you tell me, but... Once you start questioning the legitimacy, you start to descend into chaos pretty quickly. And it- well, I, I, th- I think um, there have certainly been periods in history where that was very true. And if you go back certainly into the uh, early decades of the Republic, you see um, a lot of really scurrilous uh, personal charges and also uh, charges of illegitimacy, not only of illegitimate children, which they frequently did, but of you know, illegitimacy is a process. And of course, you also had battles over in the extension of states, should these people be allowed to vote? I mean, and in those cases, white male people, um, you know, was it too soon? Or, you know, which actually was an interesting mirror of the, the process between the American colonies and the, and the British public, you know. And, uh, and uh, so I, I think history absolutely repeats itself. And I don't, I don't know if this is worse in any period of time. I do, it is certainly fraught. And um, you, you're right, there will be a lot of questioning and you are exactly right about Clinton. I absolutely don't believe the Clinton people have ever accepted this as a legitimate election. And, and um, unlike Gore, and, uh, and, and she- Gore, Gore literally been, said no more recounts. I, I'm just right. gonna concede for the good of the country. Right, 
and and Nixon essentially said the same thing, and 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 Hillary just could not do it because she couldn't believe it that that many people, and and the country is split. You know, it is really forty something for, for Trump and forty something for Biden, and and ten or twelve in the middle, and and how they allocate or whether they turn out is really going to be the big issue. So, anyway, have you seen the uh, Bloomberg report that? The Republicans are going to vote on Election Day. Conservative-leaning people will vote on Election Day. And that day, Trump will be the president. But then four to five days after, the absentees will all get counted. And then Biden will be the eventual winner. Yeah, and, yes. And uh, there's, a, well, there's a, some interesting data. There's a New York Times article from the last week. Um, and, you, you know, you and I have talked about maybe posting some of this on the website in and uh, I'll make sure you get it and you, we can post it. But there was an article last week looking at the primaries in these states during the COVID period. And in fact, there is absolutely that. You see this spike of, you, you see the first leap on election day of voters. And then you, see, um, then you see the votes trickle in. And sometimes it's five days and sometimes it's nine days and sometimes it's three weeks, uh, depending on the state and their experience with this. So the states that have had uh, absentee or uh, voting by mail, as, you know, the, some of the northeastern states, northwestern states do that, uh, and, and they really don't have a ballot box per se. The ballot box is the mail. They have a lot of experience with it, so their processes are set up to, to do that. So, um, and this is particularly important in the 10 swing states, and, and it looks from the data to me that in their report that, um, that, uh, that you'll really have, it, it will take you know, four or five days. Uh, and, uh, and I do the same, think the psychology of this is going to be very interesting in how the media handles it. Um, they will have to very much make the point that with the vote counted so far, um, and 62% of the anticipated vote is being counted now, that kind of stuff, they're going to have to be really good at contextualizing. And, um, but I also think it's going to be very hard for them to, um, to uh, um, project accurately. Now, you know, we started voting in Virginia yesterday mm. and uh, that lines were very long in a lot of parts of the state of the Commonwealth. And uh, I expect that pretty much everywhere. And, you know, I'm gonna vote by mail, although I'm sitting here wondering where, where the hell my ballot is. I <laughs> applied for it online about three weeks ago. And, uh, and, and you know, and I, of course I really believe everybody has to vote and even, you know, I'm just, up front with it. I, I, I'm a, Rep a lifeline Republican, even though I don't think most of these people are anymore. And I, mm -hmm. I can't bring myself to vote for a Democrat. Um, but uh, sure as hell, I'm not going to vote for Trump. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to throw up my, my wife accuses me of throwing my vote away. And I, I point out that Virginia is going to go for, for a Biden anyway. Um, but, but I'll tell you what, the, how he handles uh, and how the Senate handles this uh, issue of the, um, of the nomination, you know, of, of someone to replace Ginsburg, that's probably going to have an effect on my vote. And I think uh, mm -hmm. we started to talk about it, it's going to have massive galvanizing effect on everyone else. I, I think if Trump and, and uh, uh, these guys all in the Senate played games with this, as they're already doing, um, then, uh, uh, you know, it's going to make me think twice about pulling a lever for uh, a Republican for the Senate. Uh, really? Yeah, and, and we've got a, a pretty decent candidate running here who's, who you know, he is running right to the, to the center here, and he's uh, uh, Daniel Gade. He's a, a war veteran and lost a leg, and, you know, of course, I'm, you know, at this stage, I don't know anything about his record, and I'm going to go back and look at that, and I think everybody should, but uh, in, in the absence of further knowledge, I'd probably do what I always have done. Uh, which is unless I think somebody's a stinker, I'm going to probably stay down the party line because I work in the party. So it's pretty so, bad yeah, to admit that, right on a show like this. Yeah, that's, an, <laughs> that's okay. That's an interesting point. At least you're honest, honest about it. There's a lot of Trump and libertarians clothing around that you're just like, just admit it. Um, but so, you know, I hadn't thought about people delaying returning their absentee ballot to watch how this plays out. Yeah, And the totally. psychology of people like the donations for liberal groups and for uh, McConnell's opponent and the DNC last night, I guess, were record setting. And, uh, you know, the Trump has a way of taking a political opportunity and completely blowing it 
because of his impulsiveness. But he did – he has shown discipline in a couple points. Um, first was in 2016 after the Hollywood Access tape. Bannon and, and Conway sat on him and told him to be quiet, and he read off the teleprompter until Election Day, and that mm-hmm. helped. The right. second was during the Kavanaugh hearings where he didn't tweet for almost a month. Right. And McConnell now has his reelection tied to Trump. And McConnell is really responsible for the majority of Trump's big policy points. Oh, absolutely. He's the yeah. last adult in the GOP that has control over Trump. And he may get the president to be quiet at the end of this race to, to move this through. But the reality is that, in my view, Trump's style of politics is to to inflame and the right was never more galvanized than during the Kavanaugh fight because they were able the the media and the left can't help themselves they're going to nominate someone as soon as possible to get the media and the left to start picking at that you know doing the Cory Booker routine with the eyes flaring and calling this person evil and so then Trump can can just play diplomat and go do you want them in charge? You know, like right. they're never. That, that, oh, you did a good thing. That's pretty good. There. You, you, you need me to protect you for them. You know, I mean, that's, you know, that's your hair, why. Your hair's not long enough or orange enough. But. Right. He, <laughs> he is, he will pick somebody like Amy Coney Barrett, who has, yes. who's, you know, doesn't have anything in her record that's, that's probably terrible. She's probably, you know, she's probably nice. She'll, she'll be on TV and these Democrats will be screaming at this, this like woman and the, 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 the Republicans will just go look at him, you know? And I think well, that, and then, and then you know, the that. issue right now with Biden is they're trying to force him to publish his own list of who he mm. would consider. And Trump just doubled his list, um, uh, you know, last week. And, yeah. and, uh, and of course, he doesn't know who any of these people are, what their philosophy is. It's the society basically certified right. them and sent it over to him. And uh, and um, I, I think probably if I were Biden, I would probably publish a list. And and of course, he's trapped by I got to have a black woman kind mm-hmm. of thing. And uh, if he's smart about it, he will uh, publish a list that's inclusive of a lot of people. But but. Uh, uh, and then pe- get people talking about the quality. And if he's also intelligent, they won't be crazies either. They'd be more like Merrick Garland was, which is right down the center, center left as a judge. Um, yeah, so, how about that? How about McConnell's flip? What's your take on McConnell's flip? He's purely tactical. I mean, you know, he's, I, I, he, um, you know, now he's saying that um, uh, never in history has a Senate of the opposite party uh, uh, not, well, let's see, when he did it uh, with uh, Obama, it was never in history has a Senate of the opposite party um, uh, confirmed uh, a, a nominee so close to an election. Of course, there were only like one or two other instances in all of American history. So it was be kind of hard for him to, you know, that was sort of one of those three implied Pinocchios kind of little white lies. Um, and of course, now he's on the, the other side of that. And I think the interesting one's going to be, um, who sits it out. So Lindsey Graham is in charge of the Judiciary Committee. And Lindsey was very categorical uh, two years ago. uh, And they're playing that over and over saying that he would not, he would not support uh, confirming a justice so uh, close to an election in a presidential election year. So that was really categorical. And I think you're going to see, of course, Susan Collins already is saying she has lots of concerns about it. and, And she's in a tight race and down by, you know, eight or 10, 12 points. As is Graham, by the way, Graham. As is Graham. Absolutely. And then you got, um, and then you got, um, well, and for him, it's going to be, do I turn up my Republican voters? And then. Which seems uh, to be McConnell's calculation in his race is I'm just going to go full team and I'm in a red state. I'm going to, I'm going to stand by the president. I'm going to write his coattails, you know. Absolutely. Well, and then Murkowski has already said she will not. And then I think the interesting question will be, will some of these senators who decided they're not going to run again because they so can't stand the tenor of the Senate, are they going to have gumption enough? Uh, I was going to use another wa- word, yeah, but gumption will have to satisfy here um, to, to uh, man up and, and not do it and not, vote, not support Trump on this one. Um, but we'll see. You know, and I, uh, I think uh, ideally they would wait to, at least till after the election. Um, but you know, politically, they're not going to do that. This is this is the issue that is going to. This issue will change the outcome of the election. 
Um, and uh, I know both parties are aware of that, and I know both candidates are aware of that. And um, uh, although, although people are voting now, and uh, but as you you and I both point out, some of us may wait to see uh, yeah. how we do our absentee until the end. So going to be interesting. You so, know, who, who didn't want the Kavanaugh hearings on PCP in a, <laughs> right before? The, <laughs> this is going to be awful. Yeah, it's um, going to be terrible. Uh, well, it'll be if you're a, a political junkie, it's going to be red meat on both sides. You I know. feel sorry for so many people suffering through 2020 because there are many horrible things. I've never had more fun. <laughs> <laughs> like it, That's terrible. <laughs> I know. It's a horrible thing to say, but yeah. it's been interesting. Uh, Away. And of course, you know, I'm living in a county down here on the rural southeastern Virginia shore on the Chesapeake Bay, and I have seen two Biden signs and, and probably dozens and, you know, tens of dozens of uh, huge Trump signs. Yeah. Although I saw one, I love this uh, one with the big streak of yellow hair flowing and it says B-U-Y-D-O-N. <laughs> <laughs> you know everybody talks about these secret trump voters and polling and there's some evidence because of the d differential between right track wrong track versus you know biden versus trump but i've never seen a group of people who are more proud and more it's like crossfitters like you know somebody's a trump <laughs> fan because they tell you in the first five minutes like you know the secret is probably more secret bite you know the dispatch and the bulwark crowd or and their sensibilities are, are more uh, <laughs> your Biden voter. Um, yeah. You know, so Bob Barr, we, Reinhold on our network keeps talking about Bob Barr and he's uniquely awful. And um, you, you sent a story along that line and uh, I will put all the articles that Rob sent me. I'll put them in the show notes so you can grab them and see all the it's, stuff. By the way, Bob doing. Barr is the, the bad boy. This is Bill Barr. Bill Barr. Yep. Sorry. There's a different kind of bad boy. Yep. <laughs> uh, so, Bob Barr, William P. Barr, Bill Barr, excuse me. Um, I'll call him William. William Barr's attack on his own prosecutors fed by frustration with both sides of political aisle, people who know him say. Um, you know, the, the, the typical whataboutism, which is an abandonment of principle, to be honest, is, well, Eric Holder was the wingman for Obama. Why can't Bob Barr, or Bill Barr, excuse me, uh, be the wingman for Donald Trump? What is so uniquely problematic about the attorney general? Well, I think, um, well, you know, part of all of this is the challenging of norms, political norms. Um, NATO, that's a norm now after 70 years. Um, uh, various treaties, uh, how senators, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, the filibuster, uh, all of these things are norms that develop over time. And I find it interesting and ironic that so many con so supposed conservatives um, are happy to challenge them. And, and this is kind of this whole conversation around the swamp. What Barr actually said, and it was to um, uh, a group of conservatives, was that some prosecutors were headhunters, which happens to be true, and that career staff, rather than being best suited to make decisions in sensitive cases, needed to defer to him. The, who is, he is the top law enforcement official. Um, that is true. Um, but by deferring, others are accusing him of politics and his decisions, as if politics doesn't already exist in uh, law. And, uh, and as the paper says, he decried what he called the criminalization of politics and the lust among some uh, media and others to criminally charge officials with whom they disagree. And of course, we all remember, put her, lock her up, lock her up. Who was the guy saying lock her up? What well, was his boss? And, uh, and but I do think, you know, we're saying I, I um, uh, occasionally get to sit in, sit in on a, a group at uh, the Niskanen Center, which is a spin out of, of the Cato. Um, and Bill Niskanen was a great, uh, wonderful economist. And, I, and we've talked about him before, and one of George Bush Sr.'s advisors. And he, um, anyway, so they have a group uh, uh, of, so it's really sort of never Trumpers. And I love it. And I love the guy running it. Um, but you know, there's a lot of discussion in that group and others about the uh, will he be charged? And there was an article today: Will Trump be charged with some violations? I mean, I guess I think that's a legitimate question. Will will the will the New York State drop its lawsuits if he loses? Will um, they just all of these uh, 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 
charges by women disappear. We have another one from 25 years ago. I, I really, I'm kind of a give me the break, give me a break kind of school on a lot of stuff, as bad as it might be, particularly since you can't prove it with any certainty in these days. But um, so Barr, in every respect, was right about some aspects of the swamp that, um, that are true. You know, people yeah, one that, have one criminalized that's politics now. And, and, yeah. I, you know, and I think about, uh, you know, years ago, I worked for Ken Lay and Enron, uh, and I didn't work for Enron, but in, in graduate school between my first and second year at Yale, um, I went back to work uh, in Florida Gas, which is one of the bigger companies in Orlando where I, I had grown up. And uh, I had sent a rant letter out of the blue and, and Ken Lay, who was then president of Florida Gas, hired me for the summer and we became friends and, uh, and I followed him when he went out to Texas and he, he and uh, Selby Sullivan, who was then the CEO, did, did a number of acquisitions and kind of rebuilt the company. And Ken, who was a brilliant economist, uh, uh, he basically built the natural gas market and, and, and uh, some would say a Potemkin's village, but Enron really was uh, a totally financially driven company. And, um, so, uh, and when all this stuff, the scandal happened, you know, it was Andy Fastow and these guys who really ran it and these guys got off, but the prosecutors really wanted uh, Ken's scalp. It was about a, a big scalp. And, you know, Giuliani was that way when he was running and maybe some of these guys to be deserved to be it, but. It's Chris um, Christie, which is why Kushner forced him out as transition chief because absolutely. he was over locking his dad up. Yeah, for as a scalp. Yeah, so there's no question. Prosecutors, many have political ambitions. Look, look at Preet Bara and and his. If you listen to Preet Bara's podcast, he's the first guy that got basically. I think he was he in New York and he got fired by Trump. You know, it, it's a lot of what Trump does is he drops he forces people to drop the pretense. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Sometimes you're, that's good. Sometimes that's bad. Yeah. Right. Like, all right, we're gonna just immediately. We're not even going to worry about like honoring our rbg's legacy we're just going to go right to the politics you know like everybody little things like that to to the big things like the justice department and that sense of fairness and neutrality is mostly bs you know and, and that's part of what he said is like these prosecutors are some of the most political people our current mayor in indianapolis used that office of of a federal prosecutor to be elected mayor the well we have a vice presidential candidate on the Democratic ticket, who was a prosecutor and yep. prosecuted crime in order to get reelected. And now, of course, that has come back to bite her a little bit, but because she is yeah. uh, who she is and on that ticket, uh, she gets a bit of a pass. So, uh, yeah, no, I mean, everything he said was true. And, it, and uh, there are an awful lot of people who know, those who know, you know, be, who do BDO, that kind of thing. Those who know, know it's yeah. all true. And, um, and it's just the way it is. But you know, I, I do think there is a thin veneer, something you alluded to a minute ago, between civilization and the jungle. <laughs> and, yes. and a lot of that veneer is people being willing to, as G Bader Ginsburg said, uh, have a little bit of a loss of hearing uh, to things that are disturbing uh, and or a process that looks fair or, you know, a pretense of civility. and. Yeah, there's a goes a long ways. <laughs> yeah, like that, and I wrote an article for We Are Libertarians, uh, kind of talking about why I stopped giving Trump the benefit of the doubt. And the reality is that he, he a lot of the stuff that he is against is right. Like, yes, there is liberal bias in the media, but it, it's like it's there's matters of degree, right? Michael Malice is a commentator that has this great saying: "Take one red pill, not the whole bottle." You know, right. it's like it's, there's <laughs> a great. There's a quick slope from there's liberal bias to I'm not I'm not reading anything and now I'm subject to right leaning propaganda you know like the, 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 there's yes the there is a an establishment and a swamp that is problematic but that can also be a slippery slope to to believing in QAnon you know like there 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 yeah. there's a point where a lot of us just hop off that train to QAnonville because we go yeah you're right about this but you're taking it too far. And 2020 has really just it's accelerated that to such a pace. But and then I don't think people really appreciate on the right how far right they've gone. 
you know, and maybe it's the same on the left. It's just, I'm a creature of the right. And I see people that, that said reasonable things a year ago saying unreasonable, awful things now. And I'm like, that was a pretty quick, quick hop, right? Yeah. You know, like, well, so, so, so some of that's not necessarily right or left. Some of it is way down low yeah. <laughs> or, right. or in outer space. And, right. uh, you know, and, and, and the whole thing around vaccines that, you know, we, of course, we have the conversations around the COVID vaccine and, and whether people will trust it or not. I, I personally have already signed up for a trial. I haven't been told I get to do it, but I would do it in a second. Um, because I, I trust the professionalization, professionals in that business, the swamp, if you will, right. um, who, are, who are making these companies, and they know that, that they're vulnerable to lawsuits and everything, so I trust that. Um, but, um, uh, uh, we're, oh yeah, so. I, I am on the op- so. I'm on the opposite end of that. It doesn't mean yeah. I'm an, an anti mean you, But it doesn't mean you're an anti-vaxxer. I was going to go exactly, there. Exactly, yeah. right. But when, when the people that brought you Iraq and Vietnam come out and say, we'll have a vaccine by election day, I go, mm, mm. I'm, I'm not yeah. going first. Well, so, but he, I'm, I'm sort of of the view. I am a little bit of the view that if someone else had said it, they would be applauded. Mm-hmm. And it's just how they say it. And, um, and even uh, there was an interesting uh, analysis, for example, of, um, of uh, Trump, and um, I don't believe it, it's a, it's a fraud, not fake kind of thing on the discussion of COVID. Um, and he, you know, the Post actually awarded two Pinocchios to, to the Biden people because they're using, uh, uh, Trump called the, the, vac- the virus a fake, yet he told uh, you know, the, uh, the, the reporter that, uh, you know, in rage that uh, he knew all about it and it was terrible. And in fact, he didn't say that. What he said was the, the, the brouhaha the Democrats were cooking up at that point was fake. And, right. And I, I think that's true of a lot of so-called fake news. It's why the hell is it news? It is fake that it is news, but it's not that it's real and not real. But you know, like the vaxxers, you know, is that right or left that they don't believe? Yeah, no, that's not, that's, it started on the left and it's, it's on the right and it's, it's kind of, yeah, a bottom. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's not right or left in my opinion. I, I was at a restaurant last night. We, we don't go to a lot, but we went to the local um, little seafood grill on the end of the island here. And I love the grill and the people and the owner is quirky and we like him, but I mean, he, he's the only guy in there not wearing a mask. And I said, why aren't you wearing a mask? And he said, I don't believe it. I said, what, is, what don't you believe? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he says, the virus, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not bad. It's not going to do anything. And I said, well, it's killed a lot of people. And he said, well, you know, I don't that, believe that. That was, that was I mean, sort of what like the you, hell don't you believe? <laughs> you can look at that in April and go, no, I said this to a lot of uh, people that I talked to, like, okay, it's not an unreasonable expectation in March or April to say, I don't believe this. But it's going to be a much harder position to hold in April of 2021 when 500,000 people are dead. You know, like it's, I don't, at what point don't you just eat crow and go, I got this wrong. You know, like there, there's, I I don't, I don't get it. But Well, I think a lot of people were unbelievable, were not, you know, so, you know, my wife and I've talked about the fact we both believed it was a, you know, clear issue and, but we both thought it would be over by mid-May. And of course, here we are. We started this in early March when it was cold, and I've got my second cold day here. It's 60 degrees. I'm freezing my butt off because I'm a Floridian still after 50 years. And, um, and so the winter is upon us again. And, uh, it, you know, I think we're going to have this, we're going to be dealing with it through probably next summer. And what do you make of the Bob Woodward book briefly before we move on to Princeton? I, I am just, uh, I am always astonished and i'll be damned if i know i am at what would drive anyone to talk to bob woodward (laughs) knowing what he's going to do to him um and the only thing i can say is trump it is trump's massive ego that somehow he is going to be able to i think he knows that woodward is writing history and um and of course he wants to be written about in history and and so um, I just think he is convinced that he he can beat them at their game, uh, yeah. and but I think I do think Woodward is so good at the interviews he does insinuate that he's talking to you off the record. And I didn't say that, of course, but that, you know he he's just a pal and and 
he sort of counsels you at the same time. Now, I will say um, all this crap about Woodward supposedly should have revealed what he had read or heard from Trump before. That's uh, it's hindsight bias. I mean, well, but it's time. Yeah. He didn't know well, at the time what it was going to be. And I'm not even sure that he's revealing anything that anybody didn't know. I mean, I, right. I think. Um, I think it is arguable, and, and Trump is an inarticulate at best at expressing himself and what he may mean. Um, it is arguable that um, downplaying some of this in terms of panic is not necessarily bad or good. I, I'm not going to make a judgment, but I can understand that people didn't want to panic people, and you certainly could argue that Fauci and the CDC and others didn't want to um, uh, early and not, did not understand the severity of it. And of course, they also thought they were in better position than they were. CDC, that, that's appalling. You know, the CDC failures really are appalling early on. And, and that is something that's been going since um, the end of the second Bush administration. And they, you know, they basically used uh, up the supplies and everything else, and they never really replenished all that. And then they had a very flawed uh, uh, testing process, and they had to uh, destroy all of the test kits that they produced under their standards and they wouldn't let anybody else do it because they didn't believe anybody else could adhere to the proper standards so which is the real scandal is that yeah. if everybody kind of in the in the government sort of knew like everybody goes oh well he knew and he didn't yeah. inform us which is like saying a hurricane's coming but we're not going to tell you how bad it's going to be right. okay I, I get that but like if you're president and you are in charge of the HHS, CDC, FDA, and you're telling a reporter that you think that this is going to be catastrophic, why are you, and you're a free market guy, supposedly, why are you not picking up the phone to make sure that the CDC is decentralizing testing so there isn't one single point of success or failure? That, to me, is the single greatest mistake of the Trump administration because it cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Germany has only lost 10,000, has less, well, excuse me, it's a terrible way to phrase it, but Germany's lost less than 10,000 people because they were on top of testing. They provided us a test. We were well, not. They have become hotspots again. Germany, sure. Spain, France, uh, uh, they're all becoming hotspots again, as is Korea. And, and I, I think that just shows the the resilience of this virus. It, and, it's there, but you're. The you're, resilience of human misbehavior. Yeah, but not. <laughs> That misbehavior would be curtailed if people had the proper information to govern yeah. their behavior. And I, what, I don't think so. I, I really disagree really? with that. I think people have had for quite some time enough information to know that they shouldn't be wandering around in big crowds with people without masks. These are people who, who make judgments way beyond reason. They, it has nothing. To, it, that's a political statement by these idiots. And in my mind, they are idiots. Um, you know, you can, you can push back here and push back there, but they're idiots and they've got plenty of data and plenty of information. No, it's highly contagious. So, uh, but, but I want to push you on another thing about CDC. So not to excuse any of this. So there've been a lot of people who knew that the CDC did not have, you know, the PPEs and, and, um, I don't know that they knew or had anything about the process of producing the test kits, but, you know, you want hearings on that stuff. This is why you do have hearings on once this is all over and you like them to be nonpartisan, which means it probably shouldn't be the Congress. Um, <laughs> although, you know, you want some appointees from there to a commission, but like 9-11 commission or something. Right. Um, but, um, but you, you know, what people, um, presidents like everyone often find out the facts after the facts have bitten them on the butt. Mm. So, uh, you know, presidents are sitting there thinking about foreign policy and in particular about Russia and China, not about Ethiopia this week um, or, you know, Croatia. And, um, and they're thinking about uh, interest rates in the economy and, and the budget and the deficits, but they're not thinking about how much CDC gets or what the last CDC report said, because, you know, the government is huge. You know, we have what, two million people or so somehow working with or around the government, both from the private sector and the public. And yeah, people in these programs half the time don't know what's going on themselves. So um, I, what you want, and this is, this is his failing, um, it, what you want is the ability to get all this stuff to people who are qualified to look at it and make decisions who are knowledgeable enough that they can do it for you. You know, there, there's, you can only govern, you can only manage a half a dozen to a dozen people at best. And 
and he is a guy who's supported hand on management, you know, for a small company that had maybe 70 employees and he, he relied on three or four people and uh, which is sort of the right structure. And now he's got a government with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in these agencies. And, and, you know, there, I don't know how many spots are still open, but I, I would not be surprised if there were 200 spots still open um, uh, people to run the agencies. And, you know, yeah. they just finally got an appointment nominated the Homeland Security guy, which arguably is one of the three or four most important cabinet secretaries in the, in our country, in our government. So that is his big failure. His failure is to understand that he has a job of managing the government. And, um, and some, some people will say, thank God, because, you know, a lot of stuff he wanted to do did not and will not get done because he doesn't have people in place there to do it or who know how to do it properly. And others later, if they, when they stand back and think about it, will realize he didn't get something done because, um, uh, or, or he just didn't have the right people in the right spot. So, uh, so some people will be glad he didn't, and some people will be sorry he didn't. And, yeah, and yeah, the, the, I'm sort of in the happy he didn't. <laughs> I, I, I am too, and I read, I re, but I read the book um, "The Fifth Risk" by Michael Lewis, and I realize yeah. like how many different things the federal government currently does that are important that uh, that 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 ongoing lack of attention and. and I'm not a collapsitarian, as they're called. Mm -hmm. Like, I believe that stability is good for the the development and proselytizing of liberty, for the lack of a better term, is better in when people aren't worried about their pocketbooks and their and their bellies. You know, yeah, you, yeah. You, can, you can convince people when they're less emotional. And what Trump does is makes pe he makes people emotional. He keeps them off balance and anxious, and and that's typically what you know, big government people want to do instead of uh, rationalizing with you. And the way to decrease the size of the federal government is, is not the way that he's doing it. And it's, it's actually pretty harmful to the country in, in how he, uh, how well, we've talked before about it. liberty, you know, you yeah, can't well, you and I've talked before, he sort of lets the swamp run in so many ways, you know, he's yeah. not the guy draining the swamp um, and now he's creating his own swamp creatures. But you, to your point, I've heard this said about Bush, and yeah. George H.W. or George W., excuse me, and Bill Clinton, they were more, the more effective presidents were governors right. because they had to manage a bureaucracy before right. and right. less effective are the senators who just talked. You right. know, and th this is, you know, supposedly, I've always heard my whole life, oh, government should be a bit run like business. Well, it's not working no. out well. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it shouldn't be, in fact, because businesses are supposed to have bottom lines. Yeah. And the bottom line for government is delivery of services, yeah. um, whether it's uh, defense or, or health care or whatever else. And, and some of those things you just have to deliver, you know, full speed ahead, no matter yeah. the cost. Uh, although that doesn't mean so. I always find people who say that don't know much about government or I think business. I think we're getting a preview of his second term because all the adults are gone. Anything that libertarians or, you know, Republicans liked happened in the first two years when the adults who understood these systems yeah. were around. And now that those people are gone, if McConnell's gone, then he has nobody to stop him on any of the, the worst impulses. He's only got sycophants around him. You saw that in the, uh, the HHS, um, uh, communications guy that got fired this week who went on Facebook oh, Live and started saying a bunch yeah. of crazy stuff. Like that guy was a political appointee to, uh, uh, he's, he's he the took sick leave. Yeah. He was like the spokesperson <laughs> for the CDC and he was saying the most crazy QAnon stuff and like that, but he was there because he was loyal to the president. Like that's sort of a preview of a second term should it happen or, or the yeah. end of the first term, uh, you know, and I think what you'll see with the Trump second term is he'll, he'll use, he's rolling out all these executive orders, turning in his homework last minute before the papers do on November 5th. Um, and, and you may see a more predatory government towards the left. At mm -hmm. least that's how I interpreted the Princeton story that you, you want to share. Can you oh, tell yeah, me? That, that, that one's so interesting. Well, you know. Can you share what's happening with the, the education department launching an investigation well, of the Princeton? Yeah, you know, not, not to be, um, uh, no, I don't have all the details, of course, but you know the, the headline essentially is that um, Princeton is being charged by the Department of Education um, with civil rights violations. 
um, because um, uh, they have themselves said they were guilty of systemic racism. And, you know, everybody is running around accusing themselves of systemic racism these, these days. And, uh, you know, I think we probably all know that there is, there are aspects of society which um, the effect of which is, is, uh, has a systematic effect. And, and you could call that systemic racism. I don't think everybody is, and I don't think everything is. Some things are accidental, but some things are deliberate, like the, you know, the way they, uh, the New York property, state property taxes and stuff, which we've talked about before, which were deliberately higher in black neighborhoods. Um, but so this is a little bit of hoisting on your own petard. So, so the, the education department, um, uh, which is beat up all the time about not um, uh, pressing civil rights charges and activities and and I suspect they are not as tough on that as they might have been under Obama and some others before, has turned around and bitten Princeton, which acknowledges that it's guilty of systemic racism and charging them with civil rights violations. And I, I think that is so beautiful. Uh, but who, who is being discriminated against, Rob? That's the, the, that's the twist in all this. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they would say that they're, the discrimination is against um, uh, blacks and that was certainly was the intent of the, um, you know, of the, uh, the, the, the law is to, to uh, you know, undo uh, racial discrimination. But um, anyway, I, ju I just think it's delicious. I hate, I hate you know, th that's, that's where that term applies there. It's, it, is, it is a case of being hoisted on your own petard. And of course, now they view it as harassment. Um, and whereas if it were some other university, they think it was terrific. So based on, uh, so letters sent to Princeton on Wednesday from Robert King, Assistant yeah. Secretary in the Office of the Post-Secondary Education. Um, they received $75 million in taxpayer funds, and so right. that's why they're being... That's, um, that's why they have the say. Right. And so based on its admitted racism, he says, the department was concerned that the school's non-discrimination and equal opportunity assurances, quote, from at least 2013 to the present have, may have been false. Um, and... After right. uh, Princeton announced after an August meeting, he, um, Isa Gruber announced these efforts would continue this year and beyond identifying priorities such as assembling of faculty uh, that more closely mirrors the diversity of students addressing names and iconography on campus and reviewing the university's benefits with an eye towards enhancing quality, uh, right. quality, excuse me. And so Basically, they're taking the far left's cries of you're not racially diverse enough. Right. Trying to defund the university. Uh, well, and, and you know, it, I don't know if they'll win on this one or not. It will depend on what kind of judge gets to see it. So anyway, but it's, but it is, it's, it's, it's amusing um, in that you have, um, um, you have the two sides being uh, driven to the height of absurdity. And uh, unfortunately, I think we have all been driven to the height of absurdity by this administration, this president, and, uh, and the political campaign. And there is more to come. <laughs> so, and, and I can't say that this week, I think, I know we're, you and I are running out of time here, but I think, uh, I, I would say until yesterday, um, the news was, has generally been less and less, uh, I'd say generally less favorable for Trump, although I think the numbers are certainly narrowing uh, among likely voters between the two sides. There's still a large numbers around saying that they are undecided. You know, earlier, I think late last week or early this week, Wisconsin and Minnesota came in. There were two polls out of there that were uh, likely voters. And uh, uh, Wisconsin, if I recall, was very close and, and, and really a toss up, and uh, which was a surprise to a lot of people based on uh, you know, the, the police activities there and the riots and all that. And Minnesota was um, a little more for Biden, which would be disappointing to Trump. But I would say this, uh, the Justice Ginsburg's death is going to upend all of that. So it's, it's I'm like not going to make any predictions for about three weeks.
Yeah, it's like <laughs> like BC AD. Everything before this and everything after this, you know, it's it's more so much more significant in my mind that like Trump had two mandates: don't be Hillary Clinton and appoint conservative justices to the Supreme Court. That's right. And the, anybody who was center right, I mean, Jorgensen probably got gutted by fifty percent of her vote. You know, yeah. people are people are gonna go. Well, I don't like this guy, but I can't. Aff- like the. From my bushy days, I remember how central the court was to the Republican mindset because that is yeah. where the culture war is fought. And Roe v. Wade set out on the right this mentality of we've got to win at all costs in the court. And that didn't change over the last four years, you know? And yeah. so people, people are going to go, I'm going to stomach and vote for him because I can't afford the left, the leftist takeover of the court despite the fact that this was a leftist justice that Biden would probably, it'd probably just remain a 5-4 conservative leaning majority, but the eagerness for 6-3 is there. And it's, it's going to be a powerful thing on the right. It's going to be a powerful thing on the left. And it's just, it's-, it's Well, if you, both, if you look at the numbers though from the last election, um, um, uh, the Trump voters turned out in pretty good numbers. Uh, and so the people who sat home were not on the Republican side, by and large, in 2016. People who sat out on the side were on the Democrat side. And so I think you will, um, I think if the Democrats can turn out the base and use this to do that, uh, it, it is a very esoteric thing, though. You know, uh, the reality is fewer people actually care about Roe v. Wade, per se, or even know what it was. Uh, you would be astonished at the number of young women and young people who, who don't know that their right uh, to choose is dependent on that law. Uh, that, that, and so, uh, you know, there's kind of a swift education campaign here. And, and I think they're going to have to be very sophisticated about um, how they uh, pose this to potential voters who may not have shown up last time. Uh, so, in the end, I think it will probably benefit, um, it probably will benefit Biden more. And then of course, there's the other aspect. If we don't have a judge um, by election day, we will have only eight people on the court deciding all of these state by state issues coming along, which we know will happen, as you mentioned, however many hundreds of lawyers in Florida um, Mm -hmm. already. And so, uh, you know, you have to hope that the numbers are decisive enough um, that um, even after a week or two or three weeks, uh, you know, the, the court keeps keeps its cool. I, I'm not going to get whatever. I'm not going to get anything I want out of this presidential election. All I want is just a decisive election night victory so we can move on. Yeah. <laughs> like one way going to be. You ain't, you're not going to get that. You're no, not going to get I'm a not. decisive it's... election night victory. And Trump steps on it, so he's going to end up messing around. They're going to lose the Senate, and then they're, they're, he'll, but he'll win, and then there won't be an appointment. For, yeah. And you'll have 4-4 for the rest of the, the, the Trump presidency because, yeah, totally. it, you know, it'll be, it'll be wild. So, all right, well, we're, we are out of time. Rob, thank you so much. It's great conversation. Food. You didn't always. mention food. Oh, you're right. The, uh, the Diner's Guide to D.C. We've got to talk well, about it. Well, I, you know, I, I will talk about a little of that and the other. But, you know, uh, I was up there last week and mm. for a couple of days. And I will say it's just incredibly deserted. And I am, uh, you know, sad at the number of restaurants that have closed. Yeah. So I, I'm, I didn't go to any place new, so I won't review that. But I will just say it's a turn of season. And as everybody knows, I am a really good cook and my son is a chef and I'm going to take a little credit for that. And, and so, you know, I was thinking about, I've been eating crabs like crazy. I'm, I'm, I get, you know, between eight and a dozen every single day and I let them build up for a couple of days. I've been eating them like crazy, but you know, the weather has changed. I've kept catching fish in my crab trap. I'm catching red drum. You know, they, they find their way in. So I don't even have to fish. Nice. But, uh, I've decided, uh, the winter is the winter is nigh, and, and I'm gonna cook a brisket tonight. Excellent, and and, and uh, some kind of really good pasta. And the Washington Post today had um, their ten readers' ten favorite recipes of the last year. One of which was a chocolate cream pie. Oh, so Chris, if you were down here with me, you could be having a really cool roast brisket and a fabulous chocolate cream pie. 
I'm very jealous. I am, <laughs> and maybe I'll take a picture for our viewers. Please do. I will, <laughs> I will post it. Yeah, we, uh, I will be having my typical microwavable Swanson's oh, protein. don't do that. Blend. <laughs> <laughs> Eat my vegetables. Um, well, I had, I'd had a great discovery. I got my last word on microwavable. So, you know, when I'm in D.C., I, I have to, we have a little apartment. I was going to make breakfast and I thought, no, nah, I'll go down to the coffee shop. And it turns out their microwave wasn't working, so they couldn't nuke their their green chilies and eggs, whatever it was. And I went over to the grocery, and Jimmy Dean now has a, a breadless, carbless, or low carb um, breakfast sandwich, and it is made with um, uh, egg frittatas as the bun, and then the you know the, the sausage and cheese and whatever else. But I, you know, that's pretty clever. You know they. The things that they're doing for these Gen Zers and millennials like you are, are really cool. I yes. I miss things by cooking for myself. I, I cook and I enjoy cooking. Sometimes you don't get the time. And yeah. there is a – Swanson has great microwavable vegetable packs. Yeah. You know? and one of them is a Southwestern protein blend that I, wow. I eat a lot. It's, you know, it's <laughs> my version of healthy. Throw a little hot sauce on there. It's really good. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, it's been great to uh, chat today, and and uh, we have a lot to talk about as we move forward. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely do one before the election day, right after after the debates. The ne- the debates are. Yeah, I can't wait. Maybe that, that that's the only thing that might change the the race here. Well, I'm hoping that Trump does his usual number, and try, Biden looks at him and says, "You're an idiot," and walks off. <laughs> Listen, they've that's set what the, I would do. They've set the bar so low for J- Joe Biden that if as long as he doesn't come out and drool on himself, he's probably going to win the debate. But if he does, it yeah. may be over. I, so, I wouldn't debate Trump. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to We Are Libertarians. If you love the show, please share it, and we'll see you again next Five week. Five people. <laughs>